Greetings to you all! Surround sound in cinemas gained wide popularity in the early 90s, immersing audiences in a new level of audio experience. In the last decade, with the rise of object-based spatial formats, thousands of songs have been mixed to take a full advantage of this technology. Yet, one major segment of the music industry has remained largely untouched by surround sound – live performances. Of course, visionary bands like Pink Floyd experimented with surround setups as far back as the 1970s, but it never became the norm for the live concerts. That, however, is starting to change. In February at ISC 2025 in Barcelona, I had the pleasure of speaking with Scott Sugden, director of product management at L Acoustics, a company at the forefront of live sound innovation. In our conversation, Scott shared how L Acoustics is scaling immersive audio to transform the world of live performances. Kim, thanks for having us. Uh, thanks for having me here today. I think the first question before we even talk about what Aliza is, I think we have to talk about what the objective of immersive or spatial audio is for sure. live sound. Aliza is a technology that enables more varied and different experiences. Fundamentally, it's a spatial audio platform for the live environment. Not necessarily any different than any other spatial platform for broadcast, except its workflow, its tools, its design practices are all designed for the live experience. So Aliza starts fundamentally as a design objective. For immersive audio to work in live environments, we actually have to design the sound system appropriately. When we do multi-channel at home cinema, we are actually targeting the listening area generally about one couch wide. When we're designing immersive audio or object or spatial audio for a live event, we might be targeting thousands or tens of thousands of people. And it gets a lot different than it does at home. In a home cinema or even a cinema in, in the, the local mall, surround sound works quite well because the whole audience is contained in a fairly small space. If we're going to go to the next Rammstein concert in a stadium and yeah. listen to them in surround sound, we might have a small problem, which is that physics has laws and not suggestions. Yeah, exactly, the uh, speed of sound. The speed of sound becomes a real yeah, problem. Yeah, surround yeah. sound becomes a real problem if the furthest audience is 100 meters from the stage, therefore only a couple meters from the surround speaker. And yeah. the audience in the front would be only a couple meters from the stage, yet 100 meters from the surround speaker. So Aliza is about fundamentally changing the experience of sound for the audience to increase the quality, to enhance the connection, and to maintain the intent of the art for the listener. To do that, we have design criteria. We have a real-time audio processor that can handle the processing of all of this input from the band to all of the output, the speakers on stage. We have a control platform that can control that in real time, whether by the sound engineer, whether input from uh, third-party devices, whether by even those on stage. Um, and then we also have all the tools and technologies for pre-production and post-production work to follow that workflow. Okay, so could you tell us more about a typical layout for Lisa setups, yeah. as they might be different that many people used to know, like in cinemas or at home? Yeah, absolutely. So it starts, there's, there's two basic flavors of Aliza. So we call Aliza Hyperreal, okay. which is the experience of providing the highest definition and resolution system for the stage environment. We don't necessarily have to have speakers around and behind in order to have a dramatically better experience okay. for the audience. And, and this works very simply. Uh, in a normal proscenium setup or at a stadium show, we have, generally speaking, a left-right speaker. With Aliza, we're actually going to place at least five arrays above the proscenium. And we design those positions and counts based on a criteria, which is ensuring that the audience will be able to accurately localize the sound and the visual connection that's happening. So it's very different from... Uh two line arrays on the either side of the stage that everyone used to. Exactly. Now, it, it results in actually very similar acoustic power, but we end up with a significant advantage in that instead of having two giant line arrays, we might have five medium-sized ones. Okay. The deployment looks different, but ends up with the same acoustic energy for the audience, but with a very significant advantage. Okay, so don't get mistaken by the size. Uh, definitely not. All right, in, in both ways. I think there's, there's a thought process, which is I see five, therefore it must be more expensive, or I see smaller arrays, therefore it must not be as loud, right? And neither of which are necessarily true, right? So it's generally speaking about the same cost to do two big arrays or five medium mm -hmm. ones. Yeah. And it's generally speaking about the same amount of acoustic power and energy for the audience. But the big advantage here is in stereo mixing today at live events, mm -hmm. especially large scale, we actually don't really mix stereo. Okay. 
we actually mix dual mono because most of the people don't have the ability to hear both sides of the PA. Yeah. Most of the stadium for your last Rammstein concert, you were, if you were on the left side of the stadium, you didn't actually hear the right PA. Yeah. And if you were on the right side of the stadium, you actually didn't really hear the left PA. So everything that was really, really important in the mix was actually panned center. Mm -hmm. And if it's pan center, fundamentally, it's dual mono. That's not even taking into account the delay towers. Uh, Which is all mono, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah right. Yeah, yeah. Now, here's the next challenge is with Aliza, we designed the system so we don't have two systems that are minimally overlapping. We actually designed five or seven arrays that are highly overlapping. Okay. So as an engineer or an artist, we ensure that everyone can hear all of the different speaker systems. Mm -hmm. So we give you an engineer, we give the artist the freedom to actually pan anywhere within that panorama okay. of the stage and for everyone in that audience area to be able to hear all of those different systems. So this becomes an interesting aspect. I now no longer mix dual mono, I actually mix more or less highly resolution mono with freedom to pan. Mm -hmm. And every instrument that you hear, every source you hear comes from one point in space, which also means it sounds more pure and more clean. When you mix dual mono in, yeah. in a stereo yeah. PA, you inherently add interference to every signal if you can hear both speakers. And so we eliminate that problem. Hmm. Right, And then the second thing we do is we can actually hear detail of where the guitar player is because the sound for the guitar player is actually coming from where the guitar player is. We can hear the bass player because the detail and the sound of the bass player is coming from where the bass player is. We can hear the differences in the drums because, of course, we can hear them from slightly different spaces so as well. So basically, acoustical experience can match where you see the performer, performer on sure. the stage. Sure, and you have that choice, yeah. right? We can yeah. also can do something completely different and wild and crazy yeah. if that's just, what we want. It's just one of the options that's... Just one that of the features. options. But yeah. that option doesn't exist in a stereo PA. In a stereo PA, when I'm sitting just right of center, because my ticket is 15 chairs over, I actually hear the entire show from the right side. I don't hear it from the center. Yeah. Right, and if I'm sitting left of center, my entire show is left of center, not not actually from where it is. Um, so that gives a really big advantage. So that's that's at least a hyper reel. That is that stage experience. This makes a lot of sense in a Broadway play. Mm -hmm. This makes a lot of sense in a orchestral performance in a stadium. This makes a lot of sense for a, a big loud rock band where you want to be able to hear the little nuances that exist mm -hmm. that you you don't hear. The second thing we can do is an Elisa immersive installation. And this allows us to create an experience where the designer, the content creator, can immerse the audience in the world of their choosing. So what I actually can do is put speakers all around and overhead and below ground, completely up to the discretion of the designer. Mm -hmm. And I can place audio within that experience anywhere I'd like. It's the same platform, same technology, same everything. It's just what kind of experience are we trying to create? That experience makes a little less sound for a big rock band in a stadium it makes a lot more sense for mm -hmm. an immersive exhibit in a museum. It makes a lot more sense for a nightclub. It makes a lot more sense for experiences where the audience is maybe more contained into one spot. So basically, it gives you a huge palette of tools, and you can uh, adopt them for wherever need you. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And in, in in the same actual application and workflow and mm -hmm. tool set, we can also take the content we've worked on, and we can start this content development before we get on site. The tool set and application set works on your laptop you already have. Uh, yeah. You could mix your podcast using Aliza, and you could output it oh. to a 5.1 bed, which you could print oh, wow. into a, okay. <laughs> an immersive stream, right? And then the nice thing is you could then go do the live version of your podcast at ISE with a giant stage, and mm -hmm. the same exact programming would apply there, right? That, that, so Yeah, it sounds really convenient. Yeah, exactly. Okay. How does the audience experience change when attending a live concert mixed with Aliza compared to a traditional setup? You know, I think most audiences don't necessarily know a specific difference, mm -hmm. but they absolutely have a different experience, right? Most people, I, I would imagine, are not geeks like us and walk into a <laughs> concert and look at the speakers and wonder if they're brown boxes or black boxes, <laughs> wonder if uh, the lights are going to wiggle or if they're going to strobe. Yeah. Um, they're but, just coming to see a celebrity or, or a favorite sure, band. Yeah. Sure, but there's a really interesting thing, which is, when you disassociate what you see with what you hear, it takes a certain part of your brain to put that back together. Mm -hmm. And we know this. Um, it, everyone at home gets really frustrated when their TV loses video sync with audio and it's about three frames off. Like to the point you stop watching the TV show if there's like more than yeah. a couple of frames of sync off. At a live show right now, today, whether it's in the West End or a stadium show, the sound is coming from one spot and the visual is another. Our brains are actually quite okay with a vertical offset. We're actually okay if the sound comes from fairly far above somebody. We're really not okay with the sound coming from beside. And this is an evolutionary background, right? This is uh, when, when, when man was evolving 
tens of thousands of years ago and we heard the, the rustle in the bush next to us, we knew that there was a lion and we would die. It often that lion didn't jump from the tree above, right? So we're really good at knowing this difference between these two worlds. So when I'm at this show and I'm able to reconnect the visual and the sonic experience, it makes for a more intimate setting. What that does for an audience member is they connect better to the performance. And every single performance I've gone to with Eliza, I have this exact experience, which is I'm much more engaged with the show. And so as an audience member, it, it means a lot more to them. They're much more engaged. They're able to hear every need, detail and nuance. They're able to hear their lead singer exactly what they want, but they look over and see the piano that's barely playing, and they can hear the piano. And they can look over and see the guitar player that's barely strumming, and they can hear the guitar. And in a stereo mix, mm -hmm. Two things happen. One, you see the singer and you hear the sound. And number two, that piano and guitar get lost. They're completely gone. That is a huge difference for the audience. The same thing actually happens for the artist. Okay. The artist on stage realizes that the audience is more engaged as well. And listen, as someone who's been on stage to talk to people before, if the audience is looking down at their phones and not caring, it makes it really hard to want to put on an amazing performance. And so this feedback loop between stage and audience and stage and audience only amplifies and reinforces the experience for everybody. So basically it's like a glue between the visual and uh, the sonic experience, which <coughs> makes it a, well, like one. Of course, yeah. of course, right, right. And at the end of the day, think about this, like when we go to a show, are, are we there to watch the jumbo screen and listen to a speaker off in the corner? Or are we there to watch this artist that we love, yeah, exactly. right? Yeah. You know, if anything we can do to make that a better experience is a win for both the audience and mm -hmm. the artist. From the technical point of view, does the use of uh, LISA make production more complicated and does it make uh, uh, front of the house engineer yeah. life harder? <laughs> uh, it's different, right? It's different. And different is scary, right? So I'll tell you two things. Uh, number one, we're now you know putting up five arrays where we used to put up two, right? So any production manager in the world will tell you that's going to be two and a half times harder. Um, the reality is there are methods and ways to make that only 20% harder, so that's not so bad. Yeah. In terms of the biggest changes, the workflow today for show design is we're designing lights and video and sound goes over here in these boxes on the side and no one thinks about it, they just ask you whether you want uh, brown boxes or black boxes. With Elisa, you, you're having to work with production and show designers to get real estate in places you haven't had real estate before. You're asking to have speakers above the proscenium. Okay, so that's a difference. So we have to start this conversation earlier than we're used to starting this conversation. Yeah. In terms of deployment, um, every tour I've been on with Eliza, we've not seen a, a deployment issue in terms of time. It just takes planning and organization around that. Honestly, it's not much different than deploying a moderately complex lighting or video system um, in terms of that. And, and sound, sound deploys a fair number of arrays anyways. We're just deploying them in a slightly different way. From a sound engineer standpoint, it's, once again, different. I've had multiple sound engineers tell me something just like this, which is, it's far easier to get to a good mix in Eliza. Your most basic Eliza mix will probably sound as good as your best stereo mix. And fundamentally, when you mix in stereo, pardon me, when you mix in dual mono, yeah. right, you have like a piano, a guitar, and a vocal, you end up having to EQ and compress the piano so that the guitar can sit with it. Then you have to EQ the piano and the guitar together and compress the two together so that the voice can sit on top of it. And you have to do all this so that there's space for each of them and all of them can be heard. And then ultimately, if you listen to just the piano, the piano does not sound very good on its own because you've EQ'd it and compressed it a couple times to find space for the other instruments you mix. In Eliza, because the piano comes from one spot, the guitar comes from another, and the voice comes from another, they all can have their natural sound. So now you only have to cue things for the sound of the desired target of the objective as opposed to changing the sound just so everything can fit together. And as an engineer, the easiest way to find space in your mix with Eliza is just to use the space that is available to your mix as opposed to having to manage dynamics and frequencies just to get that space to work. So much quicker to start. I'll tell you that uh, one engineer from a, a major Grammy Award winning artist that's toured with Eliza multiple times has said, on that day when the trucks show up at 2 p.m., you know, the day when everything goes wrong, he would rather have Eliza in an arena than stereo. Uh -huh. Even though it's a little more speakers to put up, it's far easier to get to a good product in Eliza uh -huh. than it is in stereo, which to me, that's, that says everything, because anyone who's listening who's been on tour, we've all had that terrible day when the audio truck breaks down and shows up at 3 p.m., and it's not a fun day, right? Yeah. 
So basically, it eliminates that problem when in a dual mono mix you change something, the whole mix changes. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but uh, with Lisa, you, you you don't have that problem. Just okay. think about it. This is the the cocktail party effect. The cocktail party effect is in a noisy bar. You can talk to your friends and you can hear them just fine. And in fact, if you want, you can listen to the person behind you just fine. If you put your phone on the bar and you recorded the bar at that night, you would not hear your friends or the person behind you because the noise floor is actually higher than the person you're talking to. But because you have a second bit of information, not just volume and amplitude, you mm -hmm. have spatial information, you can pick out and listen to the individual you want to listen to. Great. We already spoke about the technical part, but could you name any acts or performers who utilized El Isa uh, during their shows? Sure. So Adele's residency in Las Vegas okay. um, was a little one uh, that, that's used Elisa. Been on tour multiple times with Bon Iver. It's been out with Mark Knopfler. Um, mm -hmm. It's been used by the LA Philharmonic on shows. Um, we've had installations at Coachella, to name a few. It's won a Tony Award on Broadway for a show called The Outsiders, and it's been on multiple other Broadway shows already as well. It's been on tour with Lord. It's been used by LJ. So the, the list is quite long. Um, we're well into the, the hundreds of thousands of performances that have been done with Eliza. Mm -hmm. It's still just the tip of the iceberg. Right. But still, uh, the numbers are, are growing. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's, I mean, it's installed on cruise ships. It's, uh, you know, it's installed in houses of worship. It's a huge, mm. huge hit in a house of worship. And it's starting to take over even in corporate AV because you think about those kind of things, there's a message that is trying to be communicated to an audience. Yeah. If you hear the person from where you see them, you engage better. Right, And you don't think that's a big deal until you experience it the first time. And that person telling you something really important and you're connecting better with them, if you can have 20% of your brain power back to go mm -hmm. listen to this message and not have to put together these two elements, it means a lot. Right, So it's been a big hit in those markets. That sounds really impressive. So if someone would like to experience uh, Elisa uh, during the live event, uh, is there any upcoming tours, gigs uh, that you, yeah, you can recommend? You definitely can check out our website. We do have a references section and an upcoming event section on the All Acoustics website. Um, there are residencies in, in Las Vegas and otherwise. Um, there's a really cool show in London that you know people might want to check out that's uh, mm -hmm. uh, got some virtual avatars and, and other things that's uh, pretty mm -hmm. interesting that uses Elisa. And there's a number of others. Uh, I would highly recommend, I've, I've been lucky enough to see most of the Broadway shows that have Elisa. Um, I'm sure it won't be any time uh, long before it's in the West mm -hmm. End as well. Um, but uh, you know, when I have Broadway sound designers who didn't design that show mm -hmm. telling me that is the best sounding show they've ever heard, um, and this is their, you know, competitor, air quote, designing it. That's that's pretty fantastic to hear. Um, Las Vegas, there's also another uh, casino there that has a great showroom. Uh, I, I'm going to be lucky enough to go see Janet Jackson in a week using okay. using uh -huh. Aliza as well. So do check that out. But uh, yeah, there's a there's a references and now playing section on our website people can use. Okay, yeah, great. Just wait, maybe one more question. Uh, is there any venues with the permanent Lisa installs, maybe in the UK, in London, uh, where people... Yeah, there's a... In, in, uh, off the top of my head, uh, you're, you're, you're hitting me on the spot, but off the top of my head, I know of of several. Um, for sure, there's Earth, which is a, an interesting venue in Hackney that has an Eliza system, fully immersive actually, so it has both the high resolution frontal and surround and overhead system in the space. Quite interesting for a very m myriad of reasons. Um, there's uh, quite a few venues across uh, the United States and uh, in Europe as well that have Eliza permanent installed, including in Asia, Australia, Singapore, and others. There is a list of references again on our website for yeah, venues they can go sure. to. There's a good 30 or 40 houses of worship that already have Eliza installed as well uh, across the world. So. Great. Yeah, thanks for having me, Kim. Appreciate yeah. it. Thank you very much, and I'll see you soon. Bye. Cheers.